I'm so glad to be sharing with you this morning. Uh, just quickly, um, if, well, if you've got your Bibles, you can open up to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, and that's where we're going to spend a little bit of time this morning. Um, I, Hi, I'm Matthew or Matt, whatever you want to call me. Uh, so glad to be here. I just wanted to go through a quick little thing in. Uh, my primary hat that I wear is I'm the president of our Foursquare Bible College, Pacific Life Bible College. And I just wanted to say thanks for those of you that have been praying. We did an amazing first week of classes this past week and our retreat and all these things. We consolidated back to one campus and it's just like we have a whole different school uh, and it's awesome. Uh, our students are hungry. They're praying together. They're building relationships. Relationship. Our chapel was one of the best, I think, of the, since I've, it was amazing. Just the, our students are hungry. Our ch retreat was last week. And, um, you know, it, the length of a service isn't always an indicator. It's a ph phenomenal service. But when you're, when I had to get up at almost 10 o'clock at night and say, we should probably go to bed, it's a good indication that they're, they're still ready to go at like two and two hours and 45 minutes, two hours and 50 minutes, and they're still pressing in. I'm like, we could go somewhere uh, with that. So keep praying for PL. BC, but I'm here today uh, to preach and uh, wrap up a, a sermon series that uh, Nick and Sarah had just been laying down over the last couple of weeks about some key moments that, ma that matter with kind of a driving theme of we need to be intentional about our faith. Um, sometimes we can kind of get into the default mode and we coast and we uh, find ourselves in a situation where it's like, yes, I'm a Christian, but we're not leaning in. And there's, there's, there's this dynamic in our faith where we need to be intentional, thoughtful, engaged, reflective, responsive to what God would be speaking to us and doing the things uh, that he's called us. And so for today, uh, our kind of scope, our focus is thinking about some of these key moments that matter uh, in the world as we engage with all of those people around us. Uh, how can we express our faith? What is our call, our mandate? And I want us to explore that today. Again, we'll, we'll get to 1 Corinthians chapter 9 uh, in just a few moments. But I wanted to tell you about two interesting uh, historical figures, just to kind of begin and maybe to start painting a picture of what, what this might look like. Uh, the first is a, a British fella, and his name is Robert Rakes. And uh, uh, I was, there he is, look at those cool pants uh, that he's wearing. But let me tell you about Robert Rakes this morning, uh, who lived in Glou uh, Gloucester, Gloucester, Gloucester. Okay, I, I got some tips late earlier because there are some letters in the middle of the that city that you don't read, but it's Gloucester is where this guy Robert Rakes is from. And he lived in the late 1700s and he was the publisher and owner of a newspaper uh, by his trade, but he was also a believer. And the reason that history records this guy is that he was a pioneer of the Sunday school movement, is, the, is why we know of this gentleman. Uh, it's hard to imagine that even only a couple of hundred years ago, there was, no, there was not a significant or widespread movement to equip or educate children in the Christian faith, especially outside of the home. Like clearly in the home, if you're a Christian parent, you would have instructed your, your children. But, but for most of the world history, people are just too busy to do stuff like that. You're farming and you're, you're surviving and you're eating and quite probably your kids are working. And so the story goes is that in this area of England and across England at the time, there are a number of things that were shifting and changing that then led to the development of the Sunday school movement. And again, some of it was clearly theological or spiritual in that we should tell people about Jesus. Amen. Like that was, that's always been true. That was always true. But in England at the time, there was other forces and things that were happening, technological advances as in the industrial revolution. And because of the Industrial Revolution, it changed the way that people lived, the way that people uh, went about their daily lives. And so in many places of, of Europe and North America, uh, it was the dynamic that you know, people were move, flooding into cities, factories were being developed and people would begin to work and they worked a lot. Six days a week, they're working in their factory, including the children. And then history tells us that on Sunday, especially with these kids, they were just kind of left to be feral and to run amok of where they were. 
uh, people didn't see the value in doing anything with these especially uh, lower class kids because they're just meant to be workers, so why would we even bother? It's hard for us even to imagine that dynamic, that you would just be like, it's Sunday, like just let them do whatever they want and everyone got on with what they were doing. And so, we, and the, that led to some problems, crime and, uh, and, and other disorder in town. And so we have this interesting environment. There's these sociological changes, technological changes that then created an environment where individuals like Robert Rakes decided we should do something about this. And so what does he do? He figures, hey, on Sunday when they're running amok, how about instead we teach these kids some stuff? So they started Sunday schools. And, and some of us have a picture in our mind of what's, I, I, was, I grew up in Sunday school. I gave my life to the Lord in Sunday school. Thank you, Jesus, for Sunday school. But Sunday school in that day, the context was is that they would gather these kids in the model that, uh, that uh, Mr. Rake started to develop. They would gather the kids like at 10 o'clock and they would teach them how to read because they didn't know how to read. They would teach them manners because they were running feral. <laughs> like they taught them uh, basic things through the lens of the Christian faith. So they, how would they teach them to read? They'd read the Bible. They'd sing hymns. Uh, and Robert was a Christian, so they were the part of this Sunday school movement clearly also was to disciple these children. Uh, so they would take them to church and, worship, and gather and worship. And this, this kind of practice began, and it began to explode. So within de the next number of decades, hundreds of thousands of children across the UK were enrolled in various forms of Sunday schools. And various organizations sprang up to support and equip with resources and curriculum. Uh, but the exciting thing again, right, was that there was sociological, cultural, technological change that created an opportunity that Robert, who was not a minister, the initial phase, the development of Sunday school in the UK and North America as it came across the ocean as well, was not that Sunday school was an in the church thing. Sunday school was an outside of the church thing, meeting a very practical need and seeing value in children that other people were like, oh, don't even bother. And he stepped up, he took an opportunity, and it's left a massive impact in the ministry of the church and reaching hundreds of thousands of people for the kingdom. An ordinary guy saw a need, got intentional, and did something about it. And so we remember him. That's the guy with the cool pants. Let's look at another picture. Another historical figure a little closer to home. This is a picture of Angelus Temple, which that's the first four square church, the denomination that we belong to. Uh, and Angelus, as in Los Angeles, the city that it belongs in. And I, I want us just to think for a few moments about the founder of the movement to which we belong. Uh, her name uh, was Amy Semple McPherson, a Canadian born, rah rah, we can take credit for it, right? Uh, evangelist who. Um, had this call to ministry and, and uh, ministered in a variety of, camp, uh, uh, of ways, tent meetings, revival meetings, all of these sorts of things. And then in the um, early 1900s, set her sights on the city of Los Angeles and planted this, the first Foursquare church, just about 101 years ago, uh, that that took place. And again, the, the dynamic wasn't that Amy was setting, up, uh, setting about to make a really big building or any of these sorts of things, but she saw a need in the city of Los Angeles and responded. Again, just like Robert Rakes, sociological and technological advancements led to an opportunity to preach the gospel in new ways. So we see this building here and you see the big towers there, KFSG. Uh, not only did Amy in her vision to reach people as Los Angeles build what was, I, I would argue, the first mega church in the United States. That domed roof was the largest domed roof. Like there's all these stories uh, of this building and they, she had enough money to dig the foundation and believe the Lord for the rest. And then it happened because God provided and, and all of these cool stories. Um, and in the church building, they would do elaborate, because they were in, Los Angeles, they would do, she would consult with people in Hollywood and they would do these elaborate musicals and dramatized sermons and all these things using whatever tools they could use so that 
people could hear the gospel. And then I mentioned the towers again. Outside the building, those are radio antenna. Amy Samuel McPherson was the first woman to own a radio station. Because they just were like, radio was developing. Technological change led to an opportunity. They got a radio station. And people all over the world, like far and, a while, far and away, heard the gospel through somebody with a vision to say, let's use what we have, the, the season of the history of the world that we're in, so that people might hear the gospel of Jesus. Later on, Foursquare US sold that radio station for a lot of dollars, which then en enabled them to then invest in more movements around the world in ways that were then relevant to the current day and age, right? It continues, this, this desire. Uh, you know, even thinking about Amy as she approached the city of Los Angeles, uh, at that time, LA was beginning to boom. People were coming uh, from various parts of the country, gathering in, looking for work, and all of these sorts of things. Thousands of tourists. Uh, it's quoted here. I, I, I will read a quote. Uh, this is from a magazine called the Los Angeles Magazine, creatively titled. Uh, and the article is why a legendary East Coast evangelist chose Los Angeles for her Pentecostal empire. That's a great title. Uh, the subtitle, Angeles Temple founder Amy Semple McPherson saw LA as an opportunity for God. And here's the quote. The lost souls for whom uh, theosophy, which was a interesting kind of religious or spiritual practice, because Amy observed people come into LA, they were open to all sorts of stuff. Or two, uh, um, and and or they didn't re respond to social utopianism. They thought it was too woolly-headed and and political. Were a natural audience for Sister McPherson's message. She knew this better than anyone. And this is a quote from her: "Certainly, Los Angeles was ripe for revival." She wrote in one of her memoirs of this period. This great metropolis appeared to afford perhaps the greatest opportunity for God of any city in America. Thousands of tourists were coming from every state in the Union, many coming to reside. Their other needs had been provided for in the city, homes, amusements, highways, and parks. But alas, there were few adequately large buildings where they might hear the word of God in its blessed Pentecostal fullness. The Azusa Street Revival had been a good start, but somehow its momentum had tapered off in the last decade, leaving that dearth in the land. Now that Sister was on the scene, the city could repair its faith deficit. In, in a sense, William Mulholland and D.W. Griffith, um, uh, mayors of LA, had already seen the city's physical, economic, and artistic requirements, so they'd met them. Now Amy Semple McPherson was here to minister to its spiritual needs. So again, a couple of examples among many we could have found. Believers that were eyes wide open, looking to be intentional, and looking to respond to various needs and various changes with the gospel of Jesus. And it's in that context that I want us to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 19 and following. You know, as we look at moments in the world, looking at moments to be intentional about our faith, we are called to look for opportunities to share the gospel that changed us. I, I, the, we, the Great Commission, go into all, the, and all, the, all nations, make disciples. This is the same call for us today. But how do we go about doing it? How do we posture ourselves to be used by God in expanding the kingdom? So let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 19. The Apostle Paul, who, if you've got your Bible open, had, had earlier in this chapter, in the kind of flow of thought of Corinthians, had talked about that he did not take full advantage of his rights as an apostle. He was a recognized leader, but he didn't, he, he, he made it kind of one of his boasts, so to speak, that he wasn't going to, he wasn't asking them for money. He was going to earn his own keep. He was wanting to be free from all of those sorts of things so that it wouldn't hinder the effectiveness of his ministry. And in verse 19, it says, for since I am free from all, I can make myself a slave to all in order to to gain even more people. Paul's reflecting the freedom that he had, but he didn't use his freedom to his own, for his own sake and advantage. He used his freedom to become a slave. That's the weird math of the kingdom of God. 
We don't hit freedom and think, sweet, I can do whatever I want to do. We hit freedom and say, how can I now give my life away? And Paul is expressing this heart and his motivation is that he might reach more people. Verse 20, to the Jews, I became like a Jew to gain the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law. And he's there probably talking, because you're probably like, well, or maybe you're thinking, aren't the Jews under the law? Yes, but also this broader category of some Gentiles had then come under the law or even some believers too. Uh, though, he, though he says, though I myself am not under the law, to gain those under the law. To those free from the law, so Gentiles, I become like one free from the law, though I am not free from God's law, but under the law of Christ. Why? To gain those free from the law. To the weak, I become weak in order to gain the weak. I have become all things to all people so that by all means, I may save some. Are we hearing Paul's heart? An expression of a life deciding to intentionally look for opportunities so that the gospel could go forth, so that more people can come in. It's also, we got to make sure that we make some caveats here. If Paul says he becomes like, everyone say like. So he doesn't become them, he becomes like them. And that's a very significant distinction that I want us to think a little bit about this morning. His focus is clear. His actions are all lined up with that. Again, verse 23, I, I, I stopped a bit short. I do all these things because of the gospel so that I can become a participant in it. I love that language. The gospel isn't just something I believe. It's something I can do. We participate in the gospel by sharing it. We participate in the gospel. Again, a great Sunday, the last couple Sundays, sending off missionaries that are going to participate in the gospel by bringing it around the nations of the world. We have living examples in our midst. Internationally, we have living examples in our midst as NUMA too of people doing this locally. I think of Marianne Connor and Night Shift Ministries looking for opportunities, responding to social, economic, technological changes and saying yes so that we might reach some. What an incredible heart that we might be like Paul in looking for these opportunities. Um, but there's also a struggle or a challenge or a risk in that mentality. Because in our desire to become like people that we want to reach, the risk is we keep sliding and we just become them. <laughs> and, and that's the balancing act. You know, Paul in saying he's going to become like the Gentiles, well, Paul by birth was a Jew. And he wasn't becoming like the Gentiles in every way, right? The Gentiles did some pretty wacky things, as in sin, <laughs> sensuality, greed, all these things. It, becoming like them didn't mean Paul threw out holiness. But he took advantage of creative opportunities to communicate, to relate, to be understood by those he was trying to reach. So we have to be careful. We have to be aware of the possible slide. And I, I want us to look at two different words in thinking about it. Adaptation and conforming. Which one will we do? This morning we were praying in the huddle at before service and I'm like, let's, let's, we go in on a word and three, two, one and different weeks are different words. And I kind of threw, I was like, let's adapt. And everyone's like, what? this is where, this is the part we talk about that. Paul adapted, he didn't conform. But my observation, and maybe your observation too, particularly in the Western church, by that mean Western Europe, North America, is we're skirting that line of conforming more than adapting. And we run a risk. If we conform to the culture, we can't win the culture because we become the culture. Adapting means 
We know who we are as followers of Jesus, what kingdom we belong to, what the worldview that we come into. We've come into the truth. We've been set free. We've been liberated from sin. We've been given new life in Christ. And so I, I, I don't want to conform to the world, but I want to adapt to it so I might reach the world. The motivation is different. I conform to the world because it's easy. We conform to the world because it's much easier to go with the flow than swim against the flow. We had a wonderful experience in Campbell River over the summer, and we're swimming in the river with fish at the same time. And we're swimming around in these potholes and things. And if you're just kind of, you can catch a couple of spots where you're just kind of standing. But when you get out in the current, you've got to work. And the temptation is to then just go with the easy flow. That's conforming. Adapting is looking, is swimming against the current in our Christian walk. So I want to look at a couple of verses to kind of spell, paint this picture out and an example in the life of Paul where he does this so well. In Romans chapter 12 and verse 1, it says, Therefore I exhort you, brothers and sisters, by the mercy of God, to present your bodies as a sacrifice, alive, holy, and pleasing to God, which is your reasonable service. Do not be conformed to, the, to this present world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Are we conforming to the world, church? And what do I mean by that? We conform to the world when we begin to think like the world thinks. We begin to value what the world values, particularly when those values and thoughts contradict with the kingdom values that we say we express. I was listening to a, pre a preacher here uh, earlier this week, and he was making a really fascinating point. Uh, again, I, I have, in, in pastoral ministry, I'm sure Nick and Sarah would share the same thing too, that regularly when you meet with people, there's moments of confession where people say, hey, I'm struggling with this, I'm dealing with that, and, and then pastoral care comes into this moment. And this pastor I was listening to made a very, very interesting comment. He's like, in all my years of ministry, I've never had one person come to me and confess that they were struggling with greed. And I was like, wow, that's a commentary on some areas in our Christian walk, we, we definitely know we're out of line with God's word, but there's other areas where there's these, these, we go with the flow and we conform and often it's not intentional. We're swimming in this river. <laughs> we're swimming in this culture. And, and the way that we handle money, the way that we handle what we think are the most important things in life begin to express or demonstrate whether we've been conforming or adapting to our culture. So the call for us is intentionally not to conform to the world, but to be aware of the world that we're in and take advantage of every opportunity to adapt to it so we can call people out of the world and into the kingdom of God. But there must be a contrast for that to be effective. If our lives look no different than the world, why would someone come into the kingdom? And this is where adaptation comes in. Adaptation means that we'll adapt the delivery message, but we don't change the message. The gospel is the gospel, and it's the power of God unto salvation for all that believe. The Christian message is, what is like the most adaptable message. Look how the gospel has been presented around the nations of the world in different languages and cultures and expressions and subcultures. It can go into all of these places. It's a, an amazing thing. The Christian message, right, when it goes around the world, doesn't assume everyone's going to end up speaking the same language. No, we, we adapt. We, we, I love Bible translators for this reason. They want to make sure that the Bible can be read in the heart language of every person on the face of the planet. And we're getting really, really close. That's adapting. It's not saying, well, you better all have learned Greek. That's the only way to read the Bible. It's, no, let's, the, the, the impetus has always been, how do we get the gospel to the people that need to hear it in the language they need to hear it in? Adapting, not changing the content of the message, but getting creative in how we bring it. Again, Sister Amy did it in operas and musicals. That might not work anymore. People, like, again, I don't, there's different delivery methods. Robert Rakes, right? He 
took advantage of the need to teach children with the scriptures. They learned to read. Adapting, Paul did this. I won't read the whole passage, but in, in Acts chapter 17, Paul's in, um, he's in the city of Athens and he is observing some of their religious practices and he gets up and says in uh, verse 22 of Acts 17, he says, men of Athens, I see that you are very religious in all respects. For as I went around and observed closely your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. Here's Paul. Paul's looking for opportunities and he's wandering around Athens and he sees this statue with like a little plaque or something on it saying to the unknown God. And he's like, that a preach. And he goes to a place in the city where they love to debate religious ideas. And he's like, I can work here. And he doesn't get like weird Christian religious and say, oh no, that's an idol. I can't even talk about it. And I shouldn't be this place because they're talking about false ideas. And will they misunderstand that if I'm here talking that they're going to be, Paul's like, I'm going to use everything I can use. So he gets up and he riffs off of this idol to an unknown God and says, I know that guy and preaches the gospel in a venue where that would totally have made sense. They were gathering for that reason. And some of them respond and some of them don't. But it's a great example. Paul didn't change the content, but he, he probably stretched in a way that some people would probably have been, you know, some Christians are probably a little concerned about the places he's showing up in to go do those sorts of things. He's looking to adapt. He's looking that, so that people can come into the kingdom. Because if they don't come into the kingdom, they're lost. Yeah. That's a whole other sermon to like hone in on, but I'm going to keep rolling. And so the call for us that we would be those intentional, looking for opportunities, adapting so that we can reach, not to conform. Now, again, I will, I will make one quick comment. Something might come up in, within us to say, I've got to do the changing. Our flesh could come up and then like, that's work. Why should I have to change for them? I'm not saying on your best day, you never think thoughts like that. But our flesh will come up and say a lot of things. Why would we go to the extra work? We think of missionaries. Hudson Taylor, right, goes to China. And he is unusual because he adapts certain cultural practices to reach the Chinese. He grows out a top knot. He wears their clothes, which was unheard of. But he's like, I'm not bringing the culture of my home nation. I'm bringing the kingdom. Yeah. Yeah. Man, that opens up a whole can of words. We don't got time for that of how, anyway, we look for these opportunities and it requires something of us, but why should we give? Why? Because that's exactly what Jesus did. And the scriptures tell us that Jesus sent us as the father sent him. Amen. And how did the father sent Jesus? Jesus gave up heaven, took on flesh so you could understand him. Do you see? This is not, let's be like Paul. It's let's be like Jesus. Jesus left the glory of heaven and took on flesh so that we could understand him. Do you want a metaphor that might be helpful for us? It would be like the contrast of Jesus leaving heaven to taking on flesh to be like us. It would be the same way that you're like, man, I just so love my dog. Rosie is like the best dog. I want her really to understand that I love her. Or would you be willing to become a dog in order to tell your dog that you love your dog the way that the dog would most understand? It's just a metaphor. <laughs> My dog's really cute, so I'm not using dog as a derogatory term. But do you see, Jesus left heaven. He, he laid down divine attributes. Or maybe he like a better word would, well, the scriptures would handle that, that, th those, that, uh, those words. He laid down his omnipresence. He laid down his omniscience so that we, he would come and take on flesh so that he dwelt amongst us, right? Thank the Lord Jesus didn't say, well, that's inconvenient. I rather like the glory of heaven. I don't want to go be hungry. I don't want to be uncomfortable but he did it for us. Motivated by love, motivated the, by the mission the father gave him. And Jesus would say to us, so I send you in that same like manner to be intentional, to adapt, to bring the gospel. 
And so there's this continual call for us to keep our eyes on the prize. Why are we here? Jesus has left us with a mission. So a couple of things practically to encourage you, and then we'll wrap up this morning. Number one, I want to encourage you to share your testimony. Like, what, how is this relating to what we're saying today? Your testimony is a unique, culturally relevant story that God gave you to share to others. Right? You were reached in, like, again, maybe I'm assuming some things that you were reached in Canada or a similar, like, uh, analogous culture to some extent. But, like, I gave my life to Jesus. Jesus has spoken to, like, uh, all of my experiences in the Lord have been in English. You know, in this culture, already you are, the, the pump is primed for you to share the things God's done in your life because you live in this place. God's working in your life, meeting needs that are relevant to the needs of others. Your testimony is one way God's already given you a leg up to adapt the gospel. As in, you live out what it looks like for somebody to go from not knowing the Lord to knowing the Lord. So again, if you're like, how do I do this? Share your testimony. It puts skin on the gospel. The Lord changed you. And that can help paint a picture for somebody else, how they can respond to Jesus. Also, an encouragement for us this morning would be a call and a challenge to find more diverse evangelism strategies Paul was like, to the Jew, I'll become like a Jew. To the Gentile, a Gentile. He just didn't say, well, I'll become like the Jews and the rest of you are going to have to make it work. No, he's looking for unique, relevant, personally adapted means to reach people for the Lord. And this is a call to us. It, again, I, there's some things that I was like, let's open up a little can and then we'll just set it aside and we can talk about it later. But the Western church, particularly in the North America, we do really good at reaching middle-class people. The, the, the Western church, the Canadian and the American church, we do really good at reaching the, the middle class. So how are we going to adapt to reach lower economic uh, people and hi higher economic people. The call is for us to adapt to bring the gospel, not to say, well, you come and meet our mold so we can tell Jesus to you. No, we change the mold to reach them. So this is going to require more creative ideas about how we adapt to reach the groups that we want to. We need to discover the groups. We need to figure out ways to adapt ourselves and then go reach them for the gospel. And then I also want us to think, what technological, sociological, and spiritual trends do we see that we get to respond to in this day and age? A couple of them that I'd like to point out. The use of technology in our society has led people, left people lonelier than ever before. There is a gospel opportunity in that. People are lonely. We can step up and fill a need. We look at the shifts in our culture of various immigrant groups coming to Canada. We could bemoan it, or we could say, this is an opportunity. How will we reach them for Jesus? We could look at immigrant groups that want to help their children develop their English language skills. Perhaps there's an opportunity there. We could look for people that might want to find, a, again, I often think there's some opportunities in and around reaching children and families where we can do something about it. I love the heart and vision behind the NUMA hub. This, all, this, this is what we're talking about. In that space, what could be done to reach groups of people that are already here? It's going to require time, effort, creativity, but God will give us all of those things by the Spirit and help us manage the different things in our lives. I also think currently in our culture, the economic stress people are feeling, the stress and anxiety about climate change, all of these things, church, are opportunities if we would take advantage of them to adapt ourselves so that we can get the job done. I've got one last two verses and then I'm going to pray. There's a lot of red numbers or uh, numbers on the screen right here. Sorry, not sorry. Romans 10, verse 14. Would you stand with me, Deanna? Would you come to the keys? That's when you know I'm about to land the plane. Romans 10, 14 says this. How are they to call on the one they have not believed in? How are they to believe in the one they have not heard of? How are they to hear without someone preaching to them? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? 
as it is written, how timely is the arrival of those who proclaim the good news. How, or, as in many trans translations, it might be more familiar, how beautiful are the feet of those that bring good news. Church, you've been sent. You have a mission. And it's worth giving our lives for. So the simple question, where is God calling you to be intentional in our culture? Where is God calling you to make moments that matter, to reach more people for Jesus? Not for the sake of your own self, not for the sake of a church, but the sake of the kingdom of God. People coming to the eternal knowledge that they will be with the Father forever. How incredible the, go the, the gospel that we have, the opportunities that we have, the, the calling that we've been given. And so now the question is for us, will, what will we do to adapt to reach someone? You don't have to reach everybody. This is why it's, 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 God will set you in places. You know people I will never meet. Nick knows people that I won't meet. And there's a bunch of people in your life that he'll never meet. So God sent you into there, your coworkers, your neighbors. So let's pray and say, Lord, would you show me where are the moments I need to embrace to be intentional about my faith in bringing the gospel? Lord Jesus, we thank you. Firstly, as we've been talking today, that you came, you left the glory of heaven. You adapted yourself so that we could hear the good news. Thank you, Lord, that you revealed yourself to us. Jesus, that you came, that you died in our place, and three days later, you rose from the dead. What good news that we've received. And Lord, we pray today that we would be like some of these that have gone before us. Paul, Amy Semple, McPherson, Robert Rakes, those that took advantage of opportunities culturally, sociologically, technologically, to adapt themselves for the sake of reaching more for Jesus. God, give us creativity, insight, ideas, dreams, and then the courage to respond to them. We thank you for this area, this city, this region you've called us to. Would you use us to be your hands and feet that more people would come to the saving knowledge of Jesus through our witness, not just on a Sunday, but every day of the week. Use us, Lord. Give us eyes to see, hearts of love that would motivate us to do it.